We have been doing in the book of Psalms, we'll cover a particular psalm that we will read through, and then we'll go back and look at the main verse, or the key verse, what verse or verses summarizes this chapter. We'll look at the key phrases, what phrases will summarize this chapter. And then we will discuss the key words. What word will summarize this chapter in a nutshell? So Psalm 126, and the Bible states, when the, Lord, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So we've just read over Psalm 126. Are there any verses that jumped out at you that would summarize Psalm 126? They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. So we're looking at God delivering them and them being joyful. So they sowed in tears. They were going through a difficult time, tribulation. They were in captivity, whatever it would have been. And God brought them through. Are there any other verses that might summarize Psalm 126? Bringing his sheaves with him. Anybody else want to add anything to the main verse in Psalm 126? The Lord hath done great things for us. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. And I completely agree for me it was verse 3. That I would say is the key verse here. Although I can't disagree with verse 5 either. Like I said, we're just doing a little Bible study. There is no right answer. There is no wrong answer. Or we're looking at the key verses, phrases, or key words. This is just to help us to think, if we're going to summarize everything we're talking about here, how do we do this using this passage? So are there any key phrases that might pop out that would summarize Psalm 126? So we've gone and looked at the key verses. 
So we're, what we're really doing is we're going from large scale, to summarizing it, to getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we've looked at the key verses, we've looked at the key phrases. Now is there a single word, not phrases, if I say words, maybe multiple words, but not all in the same phrase, that would summarize Psalm 126. I agree with you. Sowing, reaping, okay. laughter, joy, maybe even deliverance, captivity. These we're dealing with God, the psalmist is writing about they were once in captivity, they were once bound, but now God has delivered them and it is a joyous song. They're not saying, woe is me, but it's a song of, I was here, but this is where God brought me to. You know, that time is past. I was in despair, I was in captivity, I was in bondage, but God delivered me. Now, I could not discover what the poetic style was used in Psalm 126. The history of it, there's really not much history to go on. Other than we know it was one of the songs of ascent. It was sung as they traveled from their hometown to the to Jerusalem to the temple. When we were look throughout the Bible, we know that we can see Jesus Christ in every single passage of the Bible because the whole Bible speaks of Jesus Christ. So how do we see Jesus Christ being portrayed in Psalm 126? According to Keith L. Brooks. Christ is seen in Psalm 126. The return out of captivity may be taken as typical of the sinner's redemption by Christ. Surely he has got, done great things for us, whereof we shall be glad and shall give him glory continually. There are several division to, divisions to this psalm, depending on who you read after. Some will say that Verses 1 and 2 is the narrative or the story behind the song. Verse 3 is a song of joy and deliverance. Verse 4 is actually a prayer. And then verses 5 and 6 leads into a promise that is given to the reader. That he that does these things shall sow in tears, but will come forth joyous, bringing in the sheaves. Now, when we look at Psalm 126, there are six verses. But if we start breaking them down, one thing should be evident that we've seen in practically every psalm so far in the Psalms of Ascent. And if we start looking in verse 1, what's going to be one of the first things that probably pops out at us? The word Lord. The word Lord. Yeah. And why is that going to just pop right out there at us? It's in all capitals. And as we look at it in all capitals, why does that mean something special to us? If the word Lord is in all caps in the King James Version of the Bible, what are the translators trying to tell us about that word of Lord? Do you remember? The Lord of glory. He's the Lord of glory. But if we were to break it down, what name would be used in the Hebrew for the word Lord here in all caps? It's not El Shaddai or El Shalom. Jehovah. Jehovah. And when we look at the word Jehovah, what's so special about Jehovah? Exactly. Anything that you need God to be, it is right here. If you need peace, it's right here. You don't need it to know have the Hebrew name of um, El Shalom. If I'm saying that right, because I don't even know if I have the right word, I almost feel like I just made that one up. Yeah. I know Shalom is peace. I just feel like I made that one up on the spot. I'm not sure of that one. The God, our God, our peace, our Lord of peace. Absolutely. Jehovah Rapha, the God of the healing thing. Um, Elohim, if we're in a difficult situation, that there seems to be no way he would be the way maker. Yeah. Elohim being him as the creator. But when we look at Jehovah, it's all of those things. All tied up into one. 
So anything that you need God to be in this situation, that is exactly who he is. And if that doesn't make you shout, I don't know what does. But when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. So when he turned again, or he brought about their captivity, it was like a dream. What does that tell us? It tells us that they were in a situation that it almost seemed hopeless. But God somehow brought about the deliverance, and it just seemed like there's no way this could happen. Perhaps we found ourselves in those situations in our own lifetimes. You know, maybe it seems like a bill needs paid and we don't know where the money's coming from. The car needs this part, we don't know how we're going to get there. Maybe the car's broken down, we don't know how we're going to get there. It could be a numerous <coughs> amount of things. Every time I ring the doorbell, it shocks me and I don't know how to stop it. The truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter if it's emotional, physical, financial, spiritual, whatever the need is, it doesn't matter how hopeless it is. But God loves to come down and work in the impossible situations. We've seen that time and time and time again in Scripture. How many of us would love to have been Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego in the fire? I would have been. If you would really look at their situation right there before the king, everyone was ordered by law to bow down to that statue. And they said, we're not going to do it. And what was the penalty? It was going to be the end of their life. And they knew that, and they did it regardless. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that situation. And they said, our God will deliver us, but if not, we're going to worship him anyhow. And if you are in their situation, you're there standing as the guards come, maybe while they shackle you or bind you up, and then they're taking you towards the furnace. You're saying, okay, God, any time now. And you get to the mouth of the furnace. Oh, God, okay, God, any time now, we're ready to be delivered. And it's such a far heat, and the next thing you know, you're falling into the fire. Okay, God, any time now. But when you look at the situation, did God deliver them from their situation? I mean, we can get to the end and say yes, but really, they still have to go through the fire. They still got tossed into the furnace. They still experienced the heat. They still experienced the steam. They still experienced the fact that they were confined in that area in a burning fire. Who knows what was rolling through their minds? as this always happened. You know, there are times we have our faith fully in God, but that doesn't mean that things don't go through our minds. Well, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? But when God comes through, even for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they still had to go through the experience. But God still did deliver them. And they were stuck there, and for them, it was probably like a dream. Because how... Many of you think that while they were going through this, they thought that they were going to get tossed in the fire, but God was going to burn the shackles off, and he set them free, and he would walk around in the midst with them again. In all honesty, that was probably the farthest thing from their mind, because who in their mind's eye would conjure something like, I hate to use the word conjure, but think that up. You know, that, okay, God's going to toss us in, and he's going to be there in the midst. We'll come out, our clothes will be smoke free. That's not typically the way things go. But to them, for their deliverance, it was probably like a dream. Or what about Daniel in the lion's den? Did God deliver him from his situation right away? Not right away, though, brother. The penalty was to be tossed into the lion's den. Right, but I you kind of lion's den. But did he still have to go into the lion's den? Yeah. Did he still have to face the lions? Yeah. I know an angel came and shut his mouth, the lion's mouth. But do you think that was on Daniel's mind when it was going through? That God's got to send an angel and shut the lion's mouth. God would take care of it. God would take care of it. 
But does God always take care of everybody that goes through the trials? I mean, he takes care of them to a degree, but that doesn't mean that you're going to come out the way you think you're going to come out. But when God does something, he does it in such a way that he loves to prove himself as God. And as much as we don't like to experience it, there are times that we go through the difficult times, the hopeless times. But if we have our faith fully in God, we can rest assured that he is going to do it in his manner. And it may be like a dream. What do I mean like a dream? Like something that we could have never thought of in the first place. Something miraculous. Something over the top. When Israel was taken into captivity, they were not there for hundreds of years like they were with the Egyptians. When, the Egypt, when they were in captivity with the Egyptians, they were there for 400 years before they were delivered. 430. 430 years. But how long were they in captivity under um, Babylon? 70. 70 years. There's a big time difference with that. And if somebody gets taken over to be delivered in 70 years, within one generation, if that, that's pretty miraculous. When God does things, he loves to prove that he himself is God. And we love to preach it that God loves to work in the impossible situations. But that doesn't mean that we enjoy being in the impossible situations. And when God comes through that, sometimes it truly is like a dream. And he does it for us and for those around us that they can say, you know, there's no way that this was humanly possible. There was no way that this was financially possible. Only God could have done this. In verse 2, the Bible states, Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. So when we look at this passage, the writer, being Hebrew, being an Israelite, Israelite, said that when God brought forth our deliverance, whatever the situation was, their mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. They were rejoicing because there was no way this could have been done but by God. But they were in an impossible situation and God delivered them. And because of that, we are no longer in a land where we will hang up our hearts on the willow trees because we cannot sing the Lord's song in a strange land. But now we are rejoicing. Now we are singing. Now we are singing praises unto the Lord and making known his wonderful works. And they are doing that amongst themselves. Not to the heathen, not out in the public for everywhere to see, but they are doing it amongst themselves. But then we get to the end of verse 2. And the Bible states, Then they among the heathen, the heathen took notice that they were rejoicing. The heathen took notice to their, their situation. The heathen took notice to their response. And they said, the heathen, the outsiders said to themselves, the Lord hath done great things for them. When we look at Israel, and I, a lot of commentators will say that this was the captivity, some will say it's not. It doesn't matter. We've all been in those situations where we can rejoice. Let me back up. Let me back up. I changed my tracks. I need to get back onto the right track. When we look at the heathen, do the heathen worship God? Do the heathen fear God? For the most part, no. When we look at the captors of Israel during the Babylonian captivity, did the Babylonians really worship God? When Israel went up against the Philistines, I think it's first seen in chapter 5, during the time of Eli the high priest and Samuel being under him, and Hophni and Phinehas took the ark of God into battle. Did the Philistines fear God? Did the Philistines worship God? But they took the ark of God and they were going to worship it out of somewhat fear. 
Because when we look among the heathen, they aren't really loyal to one God, but they serve their gods out of fear. And what happened when the ark of God was put into the temple of Dagon in 1 Samuel chapter 5? Do you remember? Dagon fell over. He fell over. And did the Israelites, um, the Philistines, get the hint at that point in time? Not right away. Not right away. What did they do, brother? They put the Dagon back up. And just so we're on the same page, Dagon was the Philistine name for what we know as Poseidon. So what happened the next day? They came in, and what position was Dagon? He fell over and the bomb that was dead was taken off and the edge was Well, he fell over two times. I believe, I think his head, I agree with you, brother. I can't remember the details because I'm going off on a side note without <laughs> refreshing my memory. But with recently, but part of him was cut off. So they set up Dagon again, and the next day they came in. Dagon was flat down, with cut off at the waist, still laying down. So what did they do out of fear? They moved the ark of God. Because not only that, but there was a disease that broke out in that town as well. As a result, when we look at Things like this. And even the Jericho march, when Joshua and them watched Mark, march and walk around the walls of the city. Now, for the walls to come down, these are things that only God Almighty can do. And when the heathen sees these things, it's not just like a dream to those that God delivered, but it's also just like a dream to the heathen. Because there is no possible way that these things could have taken place. It's just not humanly possible. For walls to fall straight down to the ground, it's not humanly possible. To go across the Red Sea on dry land, it's not humanly possible. To go across the um, Jordan River on dry land with the waters heaped up on heap on heap, it's just not possible. And even the heathen take notice that this is truly God. And they may not always get it right away. It took them several times with the... No, no I'm going to lose it. What was it? Ten plagues of Egypt. The ten plagues. Or was it twelve? Okay, I thought it was ten. I, I, I was having a battle within my own mind. I couldn't remember. But... Each time and time again, Pharaoh recognized that it was God. Only God could do these things. So while we're looking at Psalm 126, their deliverance was so great that it was like a dream. And they praised God for it. But it was so great that even the heathen who maybe did not fear God, who did not recognize God, they had to recognize, they even they recognized that only God could do such a thing. There's no way that this could have been done. And then is those that were delivered saying, the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Has God done great things for you this morning? Amen. Is there other things in our own lives that only God could have done this? Not because of who we are, but he has come and delivered us from something that seemed hopeless, something that seemed impossible. You know, each one of us in our own lives this morning hopefully can recognize that there was a point that I've recognized in Romans chapter 3, 23, that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I recognized in 6, 23, that I was building up a bank account with all my sin that one day was going to be paid out, and the price was greater than I was willing to pay. It was something that was far beyond anything that I could have paid. But you know what? God made a way with something that was impossible. Before I was even born, God made a way because we know that there was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world that came to earth, divinity wrapped in humanity, to seek and save that was lost. And even though I was a wretched sinner, the Son of God died on a tree that I may have fellowship with God once again. And if you don't believe that, let me tell you, I can take you to a veil that was rent and torn 
And it wasn't shredded from the bottom up, but it was shredded from the top down. And they say that veil was six feet thick. Only God could do such a thing. It was like a dream the day that I felt God come into my heart and roll that burden of sin off my shoulders. The Lord has done great things for us. Wherefore, we are glad. It says, turn again our captivity, or turn away our captivity, O Lord, as streams in the south. See, these streams in the south, in the summer times, they would dry up. During captivity, these streams, they dry up. They are barren. There is no substance that we can gather from them. If our mouths are parched and our tongues are cleaving to the roof of our mouth, in the summertime, there is no refreshment or deliverance in those streams. But in the rainy seasons, those southern streams flow with an abundance of river. God turns away the captivity. He turns away our difficult situations and gives us a river, a river of abundance that we may drink from and be refreshed. And then we get to verses 5 and 6, which gives us the illustration of the farmer or the sower. For they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing and bringing his sheaves with him. They that sow in tears, these farmers, what they had to do to get sustenance, the, well, to get sustenance or make a living that year, they had to sow seed. And what happens if seed is sown on bad soil? It doesn't grow. What happens if seed is thrown on stony soil? The birds come and they eat it and it's not profitable. The only way that seed can grow is when it falls on good soil. And because of that, perhaps these farmers, these sowers of seeds, go out sowing in tears. Because this is their livelihood. This is their sustenance. This is their uh, the way that they provide for their family. And if this seed does not grow, it's been wasted. And if they lose all their seed, how long will it be until there's no more provision for them? And they die because there's of starvation, of hunger. Because there, there was no provision made. And because of that, they sow in tears. But he that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, rejoicing, bringing in the sheep with him. That one seed, if it falls on good soil, it will bring up five wheat plants. These wheat plants, each head will hold up to 22 seeds. So one seed for one head will bring forth 22 seeds. That's a pretty good uh, multiplication rate. Especially if you're going to glean it for next year's harvest. But there's five heads that come forth from that seed. So that one seed produces up to 110 other seeds. Talk about a multiplication process. Because he that sowed on good soil and sowed in tears, he shall reap in joy. His, his, his need, that thing that he sowed, whatever it was, will be multiplied. What does the Bible talk about giving? <coughs> Shake it. It's going to come forth in abundance. But how are we sowing? What are we sowing? Are we even sowing? You know, there might be Christians out there that are weeping because they have financial problems. How am I going to pay this? How am I going to go forth? But have they sold in tears the precious seed, following the word of God? Have they given their tithes every week? Have they been faithful? Because when it comes to the word of God, tithes are not an option. They are a requirement. 10% of our gross, not the net, just because Caesar takes out before everybody else doesn't make it any different from back then. We give out of the gross. But those people that cry because they have this financial situation and they don't know if it's going to be met, 
Maybe God wants to bless them abundantly. And I'm not preaching flat and rabbit. I'm preaching the word of God. But maybe God does want to bless them greatly financially. But they've only given the bare minimum. If that, maybe they haven't even paid their tithes. They've been robbing God. And if they've been robbing God, why should they experience the abundance? God might provide that need and answer prayer. Especially depending on who's praying. Because maybe they're not the only one. Maybe there's a faithful Christian that's been praying. God's obligated to answer their prayers. But have we been sowing precious seed in our Christian life? Have we been following the word of God to a T? Maybe the reason people don't come forth victorious the way that God wants them to be or the way they think they should, or even with the bare memory, is because they have not been doing what they've been supposed to be doing. They've not been drawing closer to God. They've not been paying their tithe, but rather they've been robbing God. Maybe they only go to church when they need something from God, whether it's financially, uh, spiritually, emotionally. Maybe they only dive into the Bible when they need God, and maybe then they dive into the book of Psalms. You know, the only way for us to come forth with gladness, really, to rejoice greatly, is when we're faithful. God, when we're faithful to His commandments, when we're following the Word of God to a T, not when we're picking and choosing what verses we want to go by or what passages, or even taking verses out of context and trying to make them mean something. But if we sow in tears, if we're faithful to God, if we're doing everything possible, if we're paying our time, even if we're giving, and it doesn't have to be much, do you remember one of the greatest illustrations that Jesus gave when it comes to giving? There was a line of people, and they were all giving. The rich was giving, the, the middle class was giving. Do you remember who was in that crowd? The widow with the two mites. And maybe you're richer than me, brother, and you can give $10,000 in the offering plate. But the matter is, who did Jesus say was the greatest? Her. And why was she the greatest? She put in all her living. Now, I'm not saying get your whole paycheck and put it in, because we all got bills to pay. I mean, God expects us to use common sense. But if we can give, give. But if we give $20 and we can afford it, and it's nothing to even sweat at, versus... We're going through a really, really hard time. At 20 bucks is pretty much all we have that if an emergency cropped up, there's really no way to pay it. Which one does God take notice to? Now, I'm not saying that if you let God move on you when you're giving, but we still need to give regardless. We really do. That we have a special gift, and I know we are we're a good church at giving, but the truth of the matter is, how can we expect to reap from precious seed if we have not really been sowing in the first place? Not that we sow expecting to reap. We should sow because we love God. We should give when there's a special speaker because he's the messenger of God and we want to take care of him as well. What he does with our money, he's responsible to God for if he squanders it. But have we been sowing precious seed? There's all different kinds of ways to sow precious seed. There really is. But if we sow that precious seed, even if it's taking somebody and praying for them when we're at Walmart, God takes notice of those things. He really does. And we don't, like I said, time time, we don't do these things for attention. We really don't. We don't do them to take yes, recognition for them. We don't give to God in the offering plate as much as we can or because we want everybody else to see it or oh I'm high and mighty we do it because we want to honor God when we give in the offering it's not the church's work it's God's work is what it comes down to when we're taking care and we're cleaning the church we're not cleaning the church we're cleaning God's house and we're taking care of God's house if we're using something that is quote unquote the church's we're not using the quote unquote the church it's God so we should take care of it more than us and when we get those mentality and we so that precious seed, 
we can truly rejoice because we know who our Heavenly Father is. We know what, how He takes care of us. And if we are truly serving Him in every way possible, what do you say about clothing and our finances? Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. He didn't say that He will answer all our griefs, but He will take care of all our needs. He will make sure everything is taken care of. And if we're sowing precious seed, that we will greatly rejoice in the week, in the reaping someday. And we will bring in the sheep. Because really, what does the Bible state concerning our treasures? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. We should be reaping precious seed as much as we can. Because the truth of the matter is, God does take care of us and he will bless us in this lifetime. I can attest to that. I've seen it in my own life. But the thing is, if we go through our life sowing precious seed, expecting to receive it in our reward in the afterlife, I can promise you that anything that God is going to give us in eternity is going to far outweigh anything that we, He could ever give us here on earth. If we expect to reap uh, that precious seed on this earth, we may reap it on this earth. But maybe God has something far better for us if we would have just waited till eternity. But when we get down to Psalm 126, the gist of the matter is, we were in a desperate situation. Not that we were far from God, but we were in a situation like nothing else. And just like a dream, God delivered it from us. And when we get down to it, only God could have moved in that way. And it's not just us that say that. Even those sinners, those that don't fear God and honor Him, said, you know, there, there's no way that this could have happened. Except for God had intervened. And because of that, we can rejoice and be glad. Psalm 126 is not a woe song, but it is a song of rejoicing, knowing that God has all things under control. But if we sow precious seed, we will rejoice. In the end, when the reaping comes. Any thoughts, any questions, anything that anybody wants to add? If not, we'll conclude with prayer. So with every head bowed, gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you. Even right now, Lord, we pray that you um, give the song leader and the musicians a special blessing as they lead us in the songs you can have us sing. As they praise you upon the string of instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the pastor's mind and his lips to bring forth your word that we uh, and give him a special blessing as well. And anoint our hearts and our minds to receive the message with gladness that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that we would be in one mindset and one accord, that the Holy Ghost may <coughs> move at as he desires, Lord. And we would have a mighty service, just a mighty move to God like never before, Lord. Lord, may we be willing to change and adaptable and sensitive to your spirit. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus.